I would like to make this evening's talk a little more interactive, if you wish. So I have come with a proposition, a set of things that I would like to discuss, but it's very fluid. It's a subject that's close to my heart, and I would like to discuss this, my point of view, and I'd like to see if you have anything to say or if you want to explore those concepts a little more. I've been interacting with young people quite intensively in the last one decade or so, uh, even earlier, but much more intensely in the last one week, one uh, ten years, one decade, uh, definitely, or possibly a little more. And I see this as one of the inhibitory factors in the minds of many people. I always maintain that if you want to do well in life, which I'm sure that all of us want to do, some of the blocks are in the external world and some of them are internal to us. And with the result, we get very confused and sometimes we feel that our progress is not, in our, not quite in our hands. It's mostly in our stars, or even circumstances, in our genetics, in our upbringing, because all these things determine where you go in life. With the result, a number of people feel defeated, defeatist in their approach to life, and feel apologetic about the fact that they are born into a poor family, or born into a country that's not going anywhere, where the stag economy is stagnant, or where the democracy is in disarray. Any number of excuses they have. It's better, I think, for all of us, especially for the younger people, to get that clarity on what is it that we can do about our life. Do we have any control of our destiny? Or are there many other things beyond us in our control? beyond us that control our destiny. It's an interesting thing. You can have your views on astrology or uh, genetics or epigenetics or any kinds of influences that, you'll, that can affect your life. But it's good to get some clarity and I would like to throw some of the, my opinions into the ring. And I have been guiding some of the younger people, a uh, couple of people that I'm mentoring are here. Um, I would like to start by looking at the human mind and some of the difficulties that we have, some of the opportunities that we have, some of the things we can elevate ourselves and so that we see the beauty of human mind. I've been a student of neurophysiology for a couple of decades and especially in the last 10 years I've been looking at it, some of the advances and what are they teaching us and it's, it's a, nowadays, I mean these days are called golden age of neurophysiology. It's tremendous progress has happened in understanding the brain, that's the hardware, and the mind, that's the software how brain can be instructed, how it can be show plasticity, how it can actually become bigger than the problems that we have. And a number of those things are very important developments that all of us will do well to think. Uh, no matter what your age is, it's worth taking a look at what we can do in this life. In the morning talk, I talked about important role that elderly people can play. Uh, as I, was, I just briefly mentioned that, one aspect of it, because I see quite a few elderly people. Uh, one of the things that's happening in the world, if you take a brief step back and take a look at the large sweep of time, let's say 500 to 500,000 years, one of the things that you see is human life has gone through an enormous transformation. If you observe one species called human beings, for millions of years nothing much happened, slow progress, and suddenly 
in the last 1000 to 2000 years or possibly 3000 years a number of changes have happened but especially in the last 200 years two outstanding things have happened as an observer if you look at it as a scientist we have gone in our population has gone through the roof and it will come to 7 billion plus it's an exponential growth once anything gets into an exponential growth uh, in 10 installments it becomes a million times a uh, thousand times in 20 installments it becomes a million times whatever it is today so once we're in exponential growth the numbers have grown enormously high the second big thing that has happened is not in terms of size but in terms of the longevity of human life again the simple observation is that about 200 years ago the average life expectancy average life expectancy was about 25 years you may think it's too small that's because even though you all know people who have lived till 70 80 and 90 but there have been enormous number of infant mortality cases so the average is, works out to be that that's about 150 200 years ago but today the longevity in the developed countries has gone beyond 70 again average which means there are people living till 90 and 100 and so on the important conclusion of this is that when the longevity increases what do you do with uh, with the maintenance of the health of these people there's some sections of people in japan and united states and us and so on sweden switzerland those developed countries have actually dealt with this as an economic problem but professor robert keegan of United States Harvard University who has been teaching for the last 40 years talks of this as the greatest strength that we have. The reason for that and I was very happy to see that and I'd love to share that part with you. He sees that as an opportunity because in, as a human being goes through stages from infant through child level of consciousness to the adolescent to the adult these four stages have been mapped very well very clearly in psychology and human development studies we know exactly how to characterize them what each stage is tremendous improvement over the previous stage and in fact to a child is a massive improvement and from a child to an adolescent is even a bigger improvement actually you have to go through the thing I don't have much time for it and uh, finally is the adult where you are called uh, author of your own destiny uh, there are some reasons for calling it um, and then more recently Robert Kagan and many others have done some tests and shown some people beyond the age of 40 or beyond the age of midlife actually going through they come through a transition where they go into a much more enlightened state where they are not identified with whether their religion or um, whatever they have achieved or their material positions and so on. In the age group of 20 to 40, approximate age group, many people look upon themselves as, oh, I'm Sutakar, I have a PhD degree, I have been this, I have been that, I have this house, I have that car, and I have done this, I have done that. Beyond a certain age where you have accomplished reasonably whatever you have accomplished and whatever sphere you are in life it is possible to transition into a stage of maturity which is far higher in maturity in sophistication in wisdom in efficiency compared to the earlier stage remember every stage I said is a major 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 improvement over the previous stage and this particular improvement in the is called self transformation stage it has just been recently understood categorized classified and studied very carefully um, they looked at Warren Buffet for instance he was just a very ordinary person um, bright but ordinary he did all kinds of wrong things in his childhood 
in his adolescence, got caught into for a couple of wrong things, then slowly he found his calling. He moved into an area that he liked very much. And during the, he was ruthless, he was just after money and so on. Beyond 40 and some reasonable success, instead of pursuing even bigger money than what he was going, or fame and uh, wanting to control a lot of the world, he matured beautifully and transitioned himself to a stage of uh, the whole world feels wonderful about him for what he has done, for the kind of exponential increase in that he has shown. So, if, if, as Robert Keegan of Harvard University puts it, most of us, uh, and physical de development level, we go through from infant to stage, and if we plot our growth, physical growth, it goes to about 50 up to that slowly decay comes, there's obviously a decline over a period of time. The mental or consciousness maturity and efficiency, it actually goes higher like this, or it has the potential to go higher like this, which is something I want all the younger people and the older people, two groups of people that I see, want to take notice of. It's been characterized very carefully, studied carefully. It's, it's not some kind of a, a conjecture. It's not some kind of a loose theory. They actually studied many people and understood, asked them, did lots of interviews every two years to see how the transition was happening. We see the, in the children the transition. When they are eight years old, all they want is a toy, what they, what they want, etc. There's nothing much more to it. But when they are adolescent, their behavior is very different. It's a very clear transition from one to another. Again, same transition happens um, from tribal behavior, as, as people call it in the, in the adolescent stage, to mature adults. They know that they actually author their own personality. They say during the adulthood, away from the uh, adolescent stage, they actually make some assumptions about themselves. Okay, this is what I am. This is not what I am. This is what this, this is what I want, etc. That doesn't quite happen in the adolescent stage. It's actually beautiful to see it. The reason I'm mentioning this in some length is it's one of the newer uh, developments. And people have discovered now that a lot, lot of management circles are talking about what's called vertical development. Let me talk for take a minute before I come to the main question. Let me lay the foundation of what we are trying to discuss here. Today, learning and development in organizations or even at the individual level has taken two different dimensions. Learning is external. I may want to learn about accounting, if I don't know much about accounting. I may want to know about technology. I may want to know a little more about diseases and alternative treatments. These are all external things that we can learn from. These are objective. They do influence my mind, but I'm acquiring these things, like material acquisitions, knowledge, skills, and experiences that you can get from outside. These three things, knowledge, I can acquire. Skills I can acquire, experiences therefore I can acquire from the world outside. But there's an inter inner dimension of growth and that is while I'm acquiring those things, can I improve my ability to acquire, ability to internalize the data, internalize what I have learned, can I elevate myself to a slightly higher perspective and if I do that, what are the benefits? And this is internal subjective development. So learning is external, development is vertical, the standard bifurcation that learning and done. So all of us go through both dimensions of development, only we are not able to specialize, take a look. It's only 40 and years later, after you have achieved some amount of success in life, people look at one's own internal growth one's assumptions about oneself. And this is where neurophysiology comes in and it's just some of the uh, developments are beautiful. And uh, Warren Buffett, when he was told uh, his own results, he was very surprised and he said, oh, then there is much hope for humankind. This is something I would like to share. But let me get back with this foundation that there's an internal development that's possible subjectively. 
uh, and there's an external development that I can take place, that I can plan my life with. Uh, this will have huge implications in the way we're looking at things and Google spends, Google is one of its leading technology companies, have understood and they spend an enormous amount of money in helping their mid-level to senior level managers in improving the vertical development, that internal development, how they look at life, what are their assumptions about life, how they need to be slightly strengthened and what do really wise people do? Can they do them a little earlier than 50 and 60 and 70 and 80? Is there a structured process by which we can get that earlier wisdom into that life is the question that some of the people are asking. And there are some beautiful things that are happening in the field I'd love to share. But coming to our thing, how many of you here think that our destiny is determined by external factors? External factors like stars, genetics, those genes have been given to us. Okay. We have no choice. Uh, any of you think that is completely externally determined or there's nothing that we can do about it? It's completely determined according to you, even before you're born? Or have I not understood you? I'm not talking about the stars. I'm not talking about uh, the other thing you mentioned. I'm talking about fate. Fate? Yeah. Who determines the fate? I have no idea. I oh, okay. No, I the fate. And I'm not questioning you. I'm trying to understand the yeah, general viewpoint. I'm just putting it up as a, um, as a measure of discussion. I, I could be going off this evening and I'll be run over my, by a bus. That's that right. is my destiny. Uh, while that can be accounted for by so many ways, one of the ways is to look at it as a yeah. fate. My, my difficulty is that I am not master of my, uh, of my destiny. Because I, I, I cannot do anything about this bus which runs me over. That's right. So let me tell you. Uh, there was a time in my IT career, uh, in my company there were several projects that have come and I was, there was a mail saying uh, you could, uh, you know, the number of projects, uh, the sales people are brought in, you, you can choose any of the projects and there was a mail and I went to, uh, somebody was my colleague level but in a different department um, and he was uh, uh, very unusual person, he, he told me, no, uh, you don't really have a choice. I, I wanted a particular project because it f fitted my requirements of what we were looking at or what our capabilities were. And he said, what, uh, I said, I was told that uh, you have a freedom and that's why your choice and I ch chose it. If somebody else has got it, he had somebody else in mind to do this project. Uh, Manu might remember. Uh, but he said something very interesting to me. He always thought he was an intellectual. So he said, Sudhakar, what freedom do you think you have? Did you choose your parents? No. Did you choose the family you were born in? No. Did you choose your siblings? No. Did you choose your gender? No. Did you choose your school teachers when you were young? No. And these all, did you choose any of your neighbors with whom you played cricket and so on? No. Did you choose the country you were born in? No. And all these things impact your growth, impact what you are later. So what the only freedom that you have is to twiddle your thumbs. He twiddled his thumb and showed me. That's the only freedom that you have. Everything else is kind of determined. Essentially, you are just weighing what? Sorry? No, no, look at the point. Look at the point. You are saying that there is no choice. No, no, it's not all. But there are many people who are choosing their gender also. From men to women and by team. There are also people who are taking their citizenship from other countries. These are the big people. The poor cannot change their gender. Poor cannot go to other countries and take a citizenship. But there are people, elite, highly qualified person are doing the things. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm just only, listen to the whole argument and you can talk about it. Uh, this is the argument that was given to me. I'm not, I'm not yet finished the argument. That was his argument, my boss's, my, not my boss, he was my colleague. Uh, I found it so interesting, I told him, 
I remember telling him, it's fascinating how you summarized how many things that influences and how you narrated it. It's fascinating how much you observed and collated and brought into one place. But it's more astonishing what you missed about human beings. Not everything is determined. While we have all these constraints, while my genetics are not chosen by me and many things around me were not chosen by me, I have a mind which can choose, which has made many choices and I can improve my ability to make right choices as I look at the world and as we go forward. And it is that ability of the mind to pay attention and to make something out of its life that has actually taken human life through a huge amount of improvement in terms of culture, in terms of civilization, in terms of scientific discoveries, in terms of making a man go up to the moon and controlling so many of the diseases, coming up with at cell phones, coming up with televisions, coming up with all kinds of devices to make ourselves comfortable. Human mind's ingenuity was there in almost all these activities. Whether it's we moved from uh, forest living to agriculture to industrialization to mass production and mass customization and so on, internet deliveries and so on, drones, all these technologies were a result of human ability to ingeniously devise our own life to be much better than what it was in the case in terms of physical comfort. So he said, yeah, that's true. And he left it because he wasn't. But that particular day, I thought about it quite a bit and I was fascinated by his viewpoint. Then I looked at the younger people many times and many of them told me that, you know, they feel very deflated. Then I looked at the human mind. The one of the human mind is tremendous power. All of us have its ability to visualize. You don't have to think that only Thomas Alva Edison or Einstein or some great man uh, has that ability. The one thing that's admirable is that every one of us have that ability. Whether we bring it out to the to great fulfillment or not is a matter of circumstances and our ability and so on. But I would not ever agree that one uh, Einstein's mind or some Newton's mind is far superior to mine. I think all of us were endowed with an enormously capable human mind. But this human mind that all of us have also has several weaknesses. I'll mention some of them. It, it, again, from neurophysiology and observation of life, nothing to do with, uh, you know, the, uh, literally from uh, emotional point of view. One of the, um, some of the uh, aspects of human uh, mind is, one of them is that we get distracted very easily. Mind looks at this, and at the same, within two minutes you look at something else, something else, as you are doing this, something else comes in. We fritter away tremendous amount of energy. Right or wrong is it, it may be necessary if a mother is taking care of a one child here, another child here, and is quite kitchen somewhere, and telephone ringing somewhere, she may have to do multitasking. But after certain amount of growth, the real advantages of a human mind come from ability to concentrate, ability to pay attention, ability to see a thought all the way through. Uh, to its logical conclusion, mind has that ability to get distracted very easily. And many young people, even if there is no necessity, they can't keep away from looking at their phone every few minutes. Or some other distraction. You can go into the descriptions of it later. It affects all of us at various stages, depending on how we have disciplined our minds. This morning, Tom Prakash is talking about the ability to control our mind is what we are all about. By control I don't mean any negative thing. To be able to direct the mind to where we want it to be directed. It, it has a natural tendency to get distracted and that is very necessary for survival. When you are looking, taking a leisurely walk in the evening and if 
there's a uh, tiger somewhere or a leopard. Um, it, it's you can't. Uh, you need to be paying attention to that. You can't say I don't. I, whatever I'm thinking of, let me think of it then and, and take a look at the tiger. You need to pay attention for survival reasons to quickly get distracted, to please scan the environment for any signs of danger. The mind's ability to get distracted or to move from one to another with a microsecond or even a millisecond, somewhere between a millisecond and a microsecond, has come because we needed to survive and you made it to make quick decisions and our middle oblongate and some parts of the brain, the microsecond they actually take a decision even before your thinking process comes through. If somebody pushes me and I fall down, the first thing I do is put my hand to balance myself. That's not even the thinking process. It's an automatic reaction that is taken at the middle or long at a level, not even conscious of it. It just happens because survival depends on it. If I fall down, I could hurt myself. So I balance myself out if you put me or push me out like this. There are millions of things that happen automatically in our human body and mind complex. We have no awareness of it, but they are all there in place so that we survive. It's to do with our survival. But those, if if tiger looking up when you are taking a walk is not a possibility in Bangalore in Krishna Rao Park, for instance. If you are wasting a lot of your energy in willing to be distracted, it's actually an inefficient way of conducting your life. So some of the most beautiful developments of human mind have come by, able, by our ability to pay attention undistracted. So if you move from survival state to the growth or thriving stage, the mind has to switch from a distracted mind to a focused mind. It's just an observation. It's not to say that distracted mind is better or something else better. Different age, if you are survival mode, distracted mind is, the ability to get distracted is important. If there is some bad news, you want to know it quickly. Okay, so mind has many other difficulties. One of them is it makes certain assumptions for itself. It doesn't want to change because changing is difficult. So one of the reasons we are immune to change, we know some things are bad but we don't change, is because mind has made certain assumptions and it can get away with it. It gets into a comfort zone. It doesn't like being challenged. But if you can train your mind to get challenged, gently and persuasively, you can actually move from stage to stage and reinvent yourself. So when you are in a teenager, you do, your mind works in a particular way. When you are later, when you are an adult, it, might, it works in a different mode. Later on, when you have an opportunity to take on a big challenge and do some really wonderful things in life, when you need to be focused because you are no longer worried about some survival or making some money or building a house and so on, let's say you come to some level of comfort with yourself. And if you can challenge your mind, you can come to amazing possibilities of what mind can do. Mind is often compared with a, somebody once asked me, if you, are, if you have a fantastic car like Ferrari or uh, one of those sports cars costing two million dollars, will you use used oil for it? No. Will you use that just to park in your thing? No. You would like to keep it in good shape? position. Mind has to be led with like that. We all have tremendous ability in the mind. As, a, as someone interested, as a student of neurophysiology, I can go on about it, but I want to come back to some important things. I just wanted to set the ground. So, mind has tremendous abilities and we need to learn how to improve our, ourselves by improving our mind's ability to pay attention. I once asked, I remember, which is the most important resource that we have in life, and many people say uh, time or uh, money is an important resource, or network, or my contacts are very important. But the most important resource that any one of us have is our ability to pay attention. 
if you can pay attention to any problem with a certain equanimity without mind being in an agitated state mind being unhappy or frustrated or angry or depressed if you remove these negative states if you are in a state of equanimity and pay attention for long enough almost any of the problems that are solvable can be have a much better chance of being solved there are many examples that we can give for this kind of a thing but i'm sure it's intuitive enough to but can we get to that stage is a different thing and so that brings me to the question what prevents us being in that state is a number of assumptions that we make while growing up about ourselves our abilities to do things mind quickly jumps into some cool oh he's like that because he's uh, so and so or he's come from a rich family so he's he's like that we we just stereotype people we stereotype many situations we have very quick jumps and we could be missing the entire possibilities of what we can do with that person because we made wrong quick assumptions one of the right, wrong assumptions that we make often and i see many young people do it in their 20s and 30s is oh i'm not so smart oh i'm not so bright to make money i don't know how to make money i'll never figure it i don't have a head for it these are all assumptions which actually limit us and sometimes i feel that the worst enemy that we have is not anybody outside but inside our own heads the voice that tells us oh i'm not so oh, don't get into this or oh, i'm not so smart i can't learn swimming i'm not so beautiful i'm not so smart i'm i'm not good at public speaking and so on a number of assumptions we make that voice in our head needs to be at dealt with because we we all we're always looking at the world outside either blaming the world or working along with the world somehow for survival we're not paying attention to that questions the questions that are rising in our own mind that is the internal development that i'm talking about vertical development but some of the things that can help us we need to look at and i want to tell you a couple of examples of that uh and a couple of things that can help us one of them is we have a little almost no understanding of how to work with this many of the out world outside for instance we don't take responsibility of our lives for our lives we want to put the responsibility for it or blame somebody else for it oh my stars are like that is yes, your stars may be like that we don't know but if you assume that stars are bad when they are actually good we don't know because i somebody asked once asked me do you believe in astrology i said i gave my stock answer i said i believe in astrology but i don't believe in astrologers <laughs> because if i ask two or three different astrologers i get they don't know each other i get very different answers and happened to me a couple of times so i decided that astrology may be a great science but it's communicated to us through people that i do not know how to trust there may be great knowledge and some one of them one of the 100 people that i can access may have great advice for me but i do not know it's it's also true for some of the medical knowledge what you have you go to two three doctors they may give you slightly different or very different ways of looking at it um sometimes i feel medical knowledge is not very different from astrology <laughs> and i'm not saying it just to make fun of either medical i have three of my brothers are doctors and i respect how much of benefit they have done to people but as a science it is still iffy it is still at a stage of experimentation certain things we have managed to do well but many things we do not know. in the absence of that firm knowledge why do we make assumption that luck is not with me luck may be with you in fact when i talked about 108 in one of the talks uh, somebody asked me sir you are so lucky that you got this opportunity and you uh, you yourself said at the end that you are so lucky what we are not so lucky to get an opportunity like that i said how do you know that you are not luckier than me 
is there, has anybody decided that you are not luckier than me? How do we make that assumption? You may be far more lucky than I am. And I also went through many phases in which I considered myself unlucky. But until I came to a state of mind where luck, I do not know how to interpret it. So I assumed that it's on my side. My effort to getting what I want, to making that impact that I want to do, to my aspiration levels, is in my control. Luck, by definition, is not known to me. Why do I make that assumption that it is not, I'm not lucky? In fact, uh, talking of blaming the world outside, some people get into the habit of blaming everybody for it. I have uh, an interesting thing that a uh, doctor friend of mine, Dr. Avi Kumar, told me. I don't know if it's completely true, may have exaggerated, but he told me a very nice story. He said one, uh, my friend is a orthopedic uh, doctor, and he said, one patient called him and said, look, I have, doctor, there's something terribly, terribly wrong with me. Every part of my body is paining. He said, really? Um, that's very unusual. Every part? He said, yes. You mean nose? Yes. Um, I said, okay, come over to my hospital. Can you come? He said, yes, sir, I'll come. I'm pain, but I'll come. So he came, and he was sitting before the doctor, and the doctor asked him, okay, what do you say? Every part of your brain. When since the nose is paining, he said, yes. Ouch, it's paining. The shoulder? Ouch, it's paining. Your cheek, ouch, it's paining. He said, now I know what the problem is. Problem is with your finger. <laughs> Every part is all right for you. Let me just examine your finger. And he said he found something wrong with the finger. There was some problem. And this guy was completely off his nut and thinking that every part of the body. I have a feeling this is slightly exaggerated to make a point. Uh, but there may be some truth in it. So, but. For all purposes, I have seen people complaining everybody, the boss is wrong, the organization is wrong, wife at home is wrong, the husband at home is wrong, children are wrong, society is at wrong, political parties are wrong, administrators are wrong, bureaucrats are wrong, neighbors are wrong, and everyone, you blame them. No, the point is, they may be blameworthy in some situations, but you have to deal with the problem rather than blame others for your destiny. And that is required in the forest. That is possible in a state of mind when you are calm and take responsibility for your own life. So the first thing that you need to do is to learn how to take responsibility for your own life, not blame others. They are what they are, you are what you are. If you feel think that others were immature, well, you are also immature at one stage. So let's move away from blaming the others and seeing with whatever I have to deal with in my life, including immature people or corrupt people or bad people or ugly people or not so mature people, can we still work with them? If it is my lot, either can I not work with them and that is not possible, I have to work with them, then let me see how best can I work with them. And that is what I mean by taking responsibility for your life. If that is possible, the next question is, how do I collaborate with people? And I have a simple yardstick that we need to clear our minds. I have come to this at a later stage of my life. I, tr I tell myself, when I work with somebody, anyone, anyone outside of me, I tell myself that I am not superior to this person. I tell myself I am also not inferior to this person. But thirdly, and more difficult thing to understand, I also tell myself I am not equal to this person. No, that's strange. If I am not superior, if I am not inferior, then I must be equal. No. I am unique. That person that I am dealing with is also unique. If two of us are incomparably unique, where is the question of comparing ourselves and saying one is superior to me or inferior to me or equal to me? I am a unique human being. Every one of us is unique in terms of what we bring to the world, what we bring to any interaction. A, a calm way of dealing with life is to have that equanimity to say that I am unique and the other person is unique. And because we are unique and different, incomparably unique and different, that we can together work 
and bring something else to the table that I alone cannot bring or he alone, he or she alone cannot bring. This is a beautiful thing. Every time you get stuck in collaboration, take a look. Don't blame the other person. But see if you can collaborate with better. This is a tremendous uh, uh, insight. And we'll all, you know, knowing is the first step and then internalizing it and using it in your life is something that has helped some of the mentees and, uh, you know, my friends, Srinivas Kupa, that we discussed this at length and he found this beneficial uh, in various things he does. So, the other part of it is humility. I find a lot of people are really confused about this concept of humility. In India, especially, and probably in many Asian cultures, we are taught that we have to be humble. In other words, if some, let's say I am reasonably good at maths, let's say I got 95 out of 100 consistently in maths, or sometimes 100. If somebody says to me, oh, you are very good at maths, huh? then I am supposed to say, no, no, not really. That's a cultural thing. That's, that is its usefulness. Instead of getting arrogant about, yeah, I am good at maths, we are taught and we believe. But a lot of people think that you have to have, you have to think less of yourself or express yourself as, as of someone who thinks less of yourself than what you really are. But that's not really. One of the best definitions I've come across for humility is, humility is not when you think less of yourself. Because when you think of yourself, less of yourself, it is low self-image and that's not good. Humility is not when you think less of yourself, but when you think of yourself less of the time and think more about the others. It's a beautiful definition, one of the finest definitions that I've come across for humility. And I named my son Vinay when I came to know about this definition. Because Vinaya, Vidya Dadati Vinayam, a true education is one which gives true humility. And true humility is when you think of yourself less and think more of the others. Let me explain what happens in Europe, in our minds. A normal human being always is concerned with himself. Oh, I haven't done this. Oh, I have to do that. Oh, I have to deal with this painful fellow. I have to send this email. It is me, me, me and me. You should also spend a little bit of time saying, telling your mind at a conscious level that you need to think about not only me, but others. And it's a shift that happens gradually. Then it is not that you ignore yourself, but a mind that spends disproportionately too much of time on oneself and one's survival and one's growth and one's fame and one's money and one's acquisitions and one's superiority in the community we live, which shifts gradually to others. And we can come to an equilibrium. That's what I mean by equanimity. It is possible to do that shift. And I know people who have done that beautifully. Once you become aware, the problem is that we are thinking too much, too much of the time we are occupied with ourselves. Nothing wrong with taking care of yourself, but you also have to look at others. As I was saying this morning in a talk, one of the best insights that I ever got was when I was a PhD student at the University of Science, late in the night after many cups of tea, we came to the conclusion that, uh, and that conclusion stayed with me for many decades. And the conclusion is, we don't know morality, we don't know because what's moral for one religion may not be moral for another, and so on. You know, in one religion you can do, you can pray to God in the physical form, in another you cannot. In one religion you can marry more than one person, in another you cannot, etc. Let's leave aside these differences. Let's look at what people want. Everyone wants to be happy, fundamentally, irrespective of anything else. It's a fairly good assumption. But we also came to the beautiful conclusion as a corollary of that. You cannot be, none of us can be happy when people around us are all unhappy. We cannot be healthy if people around us are all unhealthy, either physically or mentally. We cannot be wealthy if people around us are all extremely poor. And if it, it can, you can be, but it will be not be sustained. It's not sustainable because if you are a multi-millionaire and you are surrounded by slums, it's only a matter of time when some violence comes in or some 
people figure out how to get their money from you because they have to survive too. Your health, wealth and happiness cannot be alone. Now this is tremendous insight. We are actually in this insight, we are combining our concept of selfishness with the concept of altruism beautifully. This is something I want to talk about for a few minutes. I have a few minutes. Yeah. Um, what um, somebody asked me, should we be selfish or altruistic? Some of us are very altruistic in our outlook. Some. I said, my problem is not that we are either selfish or altruistic. My problem is we are not sufficiently selfish, we are not sufficiently altruistic. Because if you are sufficiently selfish, you have to be altruistic. And if you are sufficiently altruistic in your mind, then you will have to be selfish. Now let me explain. If you want to be selfish, that means you want everything to come to you, everybody to be nice to you, everybody to give you money or whatever you are looking for. And the only way that happens in this world is if you are nice to other people. So, any enlightened selfishness or any really selfish people will have to be nice to many other people. It's only then they will give it back. And that's what a selfish man wants. Now, let's look at the other one. It's a little more difficult. If I'm truly altruistic, why do I have to be selfish? The answer is simple. If you want to be truly altruistic, you want to help others, how can you help others when you are not strong? If I am walking by a river bed and I find somebody drowning in the water and if I don't know swimming and if I jump because I have altruistic motives <laughs> propelling me, then instead of one person dying, two people will die. If I want to help somebody financially, if I am not financially strong, I cannot give that. If I want to help somebody emotionally when they are going through difficult times, then I have to be emotionally much stronger. It's no different from swimming. I can't help somebody drowning unless my swimming capabilities are very high to be able to take the load of another person and same thing with the emotional side. So, if you want to be altruistic, you have to take care of yourself. You have to be strong. So this ability to synthesize both has come in this insight that if I want to help, if I want to be happy, I want to make sure everybody else around me is happy. If I want to be healthy, I want to make sure everybody else around me is healthy. If everybody else around me has some viral disease or the other, it's unlikely that I will have a great health. And so on. Same thing with wealth. So we have covered this. One more important concept and we can cover many more things. One of them is, it happened, let me tell you a story. When I, I, there's a girl called Somia Bajaj that came to me when I gave a talk. Um, the Christ College here in Bangalore. She was 19 years or 18 to 19 at that time. She said, oh, I talked about 108 and she said, sir, I find it so inspiring. I also do some social service. Can I also, can you mentor me? I wasn't thinking of, you know, small girls at that age. For mentoring, I was thinking of much more grown-ups. And uh, so, I asked, if you are doing something in the society for the poor people, that's wonderful. I don't know much about what you are doing. I don't see how I can help you. Uh, but she said, no, sir, I really have a big uh, views, a big ideas, big vision about what I want to do. I said, tell me, what is it that you want to do? What's your big vision? She said, sir, you'll laugh when I tell you. I said, try me. I, I, can, I don't have to laugh. Um, she said, uh, I want to be prime minister of this country. I said, wonderful, anybody can be prime minister, there is not a kingdom where king's children only can be kings. So I sure, why not? That was before Modi came, before I could give her an example that a Chaiwala can become prime minister, why not you? I couldn't say that because I didn't know that at that time uh, Modi was going to come. And uh, that's just before, one year before that, this conversation took place. Uh, I said, okay, I wanted to see if she has any plan for getting there. Is it just a pipe dream or is it she wanted? So quickly I asked her, what is it one step before becoming a Prime Minister, what do you want to be? Have you thought of that? I said, yes sir, very clearly. I want to be the Planning Commission head. In those days it was not Niti Aayog, it was Planning Commission. I said, how does it help become Prime Minister? How does it help you when you are becoming Prime Minister? I said, no, most Prime Ministers get into the through political process 
but they don't know what the planning commission is about. The planning commission is our ability to do some, all the resources, constraints have very well understood by planning commission. They know the best models that can work. But political leaders, I often bypass them, they pick and choose what they want from what uh, the great planners and intellectuals offer. So they, that doesn't, I said, okay, then I can see why you want to be there and then get to prime ministership or politics in the next 10, 15 years, fine. How do you want to get to planning commission? She said, I want to be in World Bank, I thought of this. I want to be World Bank expert in developmental economics. I want to work in Brazil, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and India. And I want to be known as a scholar. I want to write books. I want to be a professor in some good place. Then I'm sure I'll be invited to be a planning commission member. I want to work for it. I said, OK, that's nice. How do you want to get to World Bank? She said, I want to study at Harvard University and get there. I said, wonderful. From Harvard, World Bank, from Harvard University to World Bank, I said. So next step, I asked her, how do you want to get into Harvard? So she looked at me like this and that's where I need your help, sir. <laughs> so I said, Somya, this is your problem, not my problem. I haven't been to Harvard and I don't know anything about economics. And so, so. Uh, to cut the long story short, she got into Harvard last year. Uh, she's doing wonderfully well. She worked hard for it. She's a very smart, very focused girl. But one incident in my mentoring, I want to tell you. She came uh, first time, uh, okay, I said, come home. She came home, met my family members, and I said, okay, I don't know about anything about economics. Write one page about each uh, one econ economist that you like. And similarly, 10 pages, about 10 economists that have made outstanding contributions in this country and bring to me in five days' time. She worked on it, came back to me. Wonderful one page summaries. Then she told me, Sir, I have written these things. I have understood, I have, under, I have realized that I am not Howard material. So when she went through this exercise and saw outstanding contributions, how well they have done, some of them got Nobel Prize, some of them have done extremely well in contributing and turning the countries into much better economic cycles of development. Amartya just saying, and many others she has studied and thing. In the process, her own vision took a, a much bigger expansion. And in the process, she also felt timid, scared about them, what she can do. Even though she had a big vision to become the Prime Minister, here she got stuck. Then as I told her one thing that upset her very much. I said, Somya, I completely agree with you. You are not Howard material. It's a fact that you are not Howard material. She was, she was expecting me to say, no, no, it's okay, you'll get there and so on. She said she's not Howard material and I said, I agree with you, you're not Howard material. It's a fact. And then I asked her, do you know the difference between a fact and truth? Uh, she said, yeah, kind of, I know. I said, no, let me explain to you. And that's the reason why I uh, explained this story at some length because many of us have this confusion. I said, I define it this way. A fact is something, any data that can be verified is a fact. Like if you say it's 32 degrees Celsius now, if two thermometers say that, and if they're good standard thermometers, chances are, and that's a fact. But facts can change with time. By the evening, it can be 28 degrees Celsius. By the night, it can be 24 Celsius. A truth, by my definition, is something that doesn't change with time. Truth is also a fact that doesn't change with time. A fact is a verifiable data that can change with time. It's a fact that you are not Howard material now, but that can change. But the problem is when you assume your fact that you are stating to be true, oh, I'm not Howard material, that means I'm sunk. I have no destiny beyond this because I have this a truth. There's nothing I can do about it. It doesn't change with time. That's where we, she got stuck. Then I told her that you need to understand that these facts, almost any facts that you have about you are fine and generally changeable. And wherever it is possible to change, it's just a fact. If you are poor today, any of you, or unhealthy today, or 
not athletic or not something else, you can change that. Most of the time, these are facts that can be changed. But if you assume that they are truths, I'm not good looking, I'm not smart, I can't speak well, I, ca I can't do business, I can't do this, I can't do that. If you assume that to be truth, you're actually limiting your ability to possibly do that when it is in the realm of possibilities. And that is the danger. So, um, about a month back when I met her, uh, she's in the US, but she's come to do some internship in uh, uh, Africa uh, as a part of summer internship. She's doing that right now. Uh, she came and uh, when I met her, asked her uh, about the thing. She said, of all the things I have learned from you, this one, the distinction between truth and fact, every time I get scared of, you know, that I can't, she was the youngest in her class. She's at Princeton University. She took Princeton ship, even though she got into Harvard because of they gave her a huge scholarship and they are all comparable. Uh, Newton, I mean, Princeton is where her, her uh, immediate supervisor that she reports to is a Nobel Prize winner at that level. There are many Nobel Prize winners in that university. So Harvard also has some, but they gave a good scholarship, so she went to Princeton University. She okay, are we running out of time? A few minutes more. And so the reason I mentioned that is she said, of all the things I've learned from you, it is this one that most of the things are rich facts and I can change them. If you look at the political scenario today or the honesty climate, the business climate in this country, you may have reasons to be depressed about. You might feel terrible, terrible things about this thing because you have seen some facts. But they're all facts and they can change. And much more remarkable changes have taken place than human mind generally anticipates on the basis of what it knows. Huge improvements have come into this country. In 1980s, I remember some of my friends came back from the United States out of love for India or out for the, wanting to take care of the parents. And they couldn't get a telephone connection in three years time and they went back. I know at least two of my friends who went back. And they said, this country will never improve. I'm willing to pay money and I want a telephone connection and I don't get it. For love or money, I'm not able to get it. So what, what hope is there when there is such a poor infrastructure in this country, they went back. But today, my maid servant has two phones. I don't know what she does with two phones, but she has two phones. Why is this? How is this possible? A transition of such a huge proportions has taken place. It's possible that we all go through huge phase changes. So if you're facts based, you understand it's a fact, you understand it can change. If you think of it as a fact as like Gravitational law, it doesn't change from morning to evening. The thermodynamic law doesn't change with morning to evening. But if you assume that you're not smart, or you, this country will never improve, chances are, with that assumption, you may be totally out of sync with reality. It is possible. So if Somya didn't take that position, she wouldn't have gotten into Harvard and Princeton and Columbia. She got into all the three universities. She's the youngest in her class. Remarkable little girl. I have so much of affection for her. She used to come. She's almost like a daughter in my family. Uh, Srini knows her. It's amazing to see this kind of transformation. It's not about me, it's about the girl. And the clarity that she got gave her the energy. Why do we need clarity about what collaboration is or what humility is, what we can do in this world? If we get clarity, our mind is not confused and going pulling this way and this way. If your car is going with two, all the four wheels in different directions, you won't go anywhere. We need to be aligned. We need to get clarity in our thinking. If you do that, if you get clarity and many small things in which you, the inner voice in you is controlling you, guiding you, you open up your personality to the possibilities. When I was in academics in the Institute of Science, I never thought I would understand business, but I took a chance at the age of 40 to jump and see what it's like. 
and I told my wife to keep her job so that we can need to at least a day when I fail. But I took a chance, went there, and there was no looking back. I did well in the reasonably well in the IT wave. You can say I was lucky, but how do you know you are not luckier than me? But I, in case if it wouldn't work for me, I kept alternatives. I told myself I love teaching, and I can always find a teaching job. But took a step at an age when everybody in the engineering of science told me, all my friends told me. You are an idiot to take that step. You are not very good at business. You don't know anything about business. You are jumping in. You've got responsibilities for your family. I agreed with them. I was an idiot and moved on because you can't argue with them. <laughs> Today, some of them wished that they had done this same step at the right time as I did. We never know. But if you are intelligent, if your mind is calm, and you take chances with yourself, if you are learning oriented. I'd like learning is something that human brain is enormously capable of, but we ignore that aspect of it. Today I may not know something. It doesn't mean I won't know it after some time. I want to close with one example of learning. I met some years ago, quite a few years ago, when I was talking to some youngsters. One 42-year-old man said, I asked them, asked a group of people, learn one thing that you think is difficult and once you do that, once you do something that's bothering you, you wish you could learn and you have not learned it, uh, you know, you, once you master that, then you realize that you can break other barriers also. Learn one thing. And so one person said, I want to learn cycling. I was surprised. The grown-up man asking for cycling. He said, it's always bothered me. I know I don't need cycling. I have a car. I just want to learn cycling. Uh, because it's, I feel jealous when other when children are uh, cycling beautifully, and I fell down sometimes when I was young and I never learned it. I was afraid. I got through engineering. I got through a good job, and everything else is fine except that this is bothers me. I said, okay, overcome that. Between him and me, we got together and did things. And I told him, what makes learning of cycling difficult is the same thing for many other things, is that. When you are pedaling, you need to do two things when you are cycling. You need to pedal and you need to keep balance. When your mind shifts for the first time learning to balance, then you are stopped pedaling for a few seconds and then you slow down and the balance becomes difficult and you fall down. When you are concentrating on pedaling, your balance is gone and you fall down. So it's an interesting thing. Each is eating into the other and brain adopts, a child's brain adopts much faster between balancing and cycling and pedaling. A little brain, because of certain uh, difficult uh, assumptions it makes and uh, certain habits it has, it can't shift that fast. So either you fall down. So I said the best thing to do is to be come to a slope, go to a flyover kind of thing or any slope, and don't worry about pedaling, just learn balancing. And between him and me, we did that. After doing about 10 times that. He actually understood that he has no problem with balancing. His muscles, there's what's called muscle memory. Muscles know how to balance. You don't consciously turn this side and you're falling this side and so on. You have to do it unconsciously or subconsciously. And did that. After he got comfortable in about half an hour's time, it managing, he was not worried about that. He did about 11 times or 12 times. First two times he fell down, but after he learned how to do it, then it is a question of paddling. Then he came to some plain ground. He knew that he doesn't have to worry about this. No concentration is one. You have to unbundle some of these things that you want to learn. Sometimes learning one comes in the way of the learning the other. Its mind keeps shifting. It's again multitasking problem. If you can stock one thing, I was advising a startup company the other day. You're trying to do marketing, you're trying to do research, you're trying to do finance, raising finance, you're trying to get customers. You're a small company, you can't afford to do all that. Do one thing well, and do that so well you get some money, and then you build it up. And they're just about beginning to do well. And the jury is still out, and we don't know how it will happen. But they're now beginning to feel comfortable with their ability. Do one small thing. We try to do too many things. Mind cannot learn those things at the same time because it's, and it gets frustrated. And a frustrated mind is the biggest impediment that you can have in your life. So, keep your mind calm, 
learn to collaborate with others with certain openness, knowing that we are all unique. Learn to be humble, and humility is about thinking more about the others. Not constantly be worried about yourself and your progress and your growth and your survival, it's because it's mixed. Your growth and your survival is mixed with uh, people around you too. So this is the uh, this is some of the messages that I'd like to take. I am sorry I did not get to interact as much as I wanted because I wanted to leave the message and we can do it some other time if you want. Um, there have been 